All right. Good morning, everybody. If you're sitting up front, it's loud, right? Sorry. We might be able to direct those out a little bit. We are so excited to welcome everybody out here to the Spanish Fork Airport and to Hangar 107 for this awesome event. It's being live streamed right now. We've uh, got people from uh, England, Germany, uh, Canada, all sorts of other places. So um, we're really excited if you're joining us uh, in person or virtually for this event to have you guys here and to talk about aviation safety and the things that can help us be better pilots. Um, for today's agenda, I'm going to turn the time over to Christian Davis, the Spanish Fork Airport Manager. He's going to talk to us for, for a minute, then we're going to hear from one of our sponsors, Jason, from FLT Flight Academy, and then I'll come back up and introduce our speakers and we'll get rolling. Well, welcome out, everybody. A couple of housekeeping items first. Um, we've got a restroom in the corner back here if you need a restroom. We've also got more restrooms down to the east at the airport office. Um, a little bit of a walk there, but uh, right now the porta potty in the corner is the best we've got. Um, we've also got Spanish Work Airport and our air show merch over here if you're interested. Uh, purchasing that goes to help supporting breakfast and events like this, so definitely uh, grab some merch over there. And then we're really excited to have Mike and Juan here to speak about safety, um, kind of pertinent to our local aviation scene. Um, Spanish Works, obviously, a, a quickly growing airport. We've got a lot of planes in the pattern all the time and a lot of safety issues that we face on a daily basis just operating out of this airport. So I'm really looking forward to the insights they have, and we'll look forward to a great Q&A session afterwards. So thanks again for coming out. Um, last housekeeping item, if you have not RSVP'd to this event, if you'd scan that code and please RSVP, that kind of helps give us a kind of end head count of who attended, and then we'll notify you of future events um, as they happen over the next couple of years. So thanks so much. Okay. Jason, where are you at? He's trying to get breakfast, like everybody else here. All right. Yeah, he left me hanging. That's okay. We'll ad adapt and adjust. Jason, here you go. Sorry about that. Making sure your food's coming out as fast as I possibly can. Um, thank you guys so much for coming out. Really appreciate it. My name is Jason Clark. I'm owner and operator of Flight Academy. Um, we're one of the newest schools that have moved down here. Um, we have amazing plans to grow with Spanish Fork, including bringing an aircraft manufacturer down here, um, as well as growing our flight school. Um, we plan on being amazing neighbors to everybody. Um, we really want to grow with you guys and be respectful and most importantly be safe. So we want to make sure that we're a good point of contact or have a single point of contact for all of our instructors and all of our team that, um, that we can work safely with the airport and make sure we grow with you guys. Um, once again, we're the sponsor of the food today and uh, we just want to make sure that everyone's taken care of and everybody's good. But I appreciate you guys coming out and uh, yeah, if we can be better neighbors, make sure you let us know. So thank you guys very much. Okay, we're cranking, I promise. Um, okay, so when I first um, built this hangar, I was so excited because I wanted to host an event like this um, uh, only out of my desire to um, promote aviation and uh, follow sort of a passion that I had, but I hoped that we would be able to host events that increased aviation safety, inspired new pilots, and also helped us to rem remember some of the amazing history of aviation and the experiences, whether those were military driven or other stuff. So we hope that this is the first of many different experiences that we have here at Hangar 107. Um, one of my good friends, Mike Reeder, are you here? Hey, Mike. So he didn't know I was gonna do this, but he and I flew out to Beale Air Force Base, um, probably what, year and a half, two years ago. And uh, he, uh, is a retired major in the US Air Force and uh, was connected with the U2 program and uh, got to take me out there and have a chance to look at this amazing aircraft and help it land and everything else. Um, it was an awesome experience uh, watching guys get dressed up in the flight suits. That's Mike eating one of the um, uh, little meals that they give you. 
you have to uh, shove that tube through the space helmet that the U-2 pilot flies in to, to eat. So we chewed on some of those on our flight back out of Beale. Um, but the coolest part of the visit was I got to meet Brian Shul. We went and met with him in Marysville. He is the SR-71 pilot that if you've seen the YouTube video, um, the LA speed check story, um, that's him, right? That's his story. So we went to lunch with him afterwards and we're planning that he was going to be our first speaker here. Um, he ended up passing away unexpectedly this past year, and I was so saddened and disappointed by that. Besides being an amazing aviator, he really inspired people to live a better life. He was shot down over Vietnam, was burned over most of his body, told he'd never fly again, uh, ended up coming back, uh, becoming a Top Gun instructor, flew the A-10, and then decided he wanted to fly the biggest, baddest airplane that's ever existed, which was the SR-71, and ended up doing that. He was also an avid photographer, and some of the most iconic uh, photographs that we've got of the SR-71 today were taken by him, um, either uh, illicitly on a tarmac, you know, before they're taken off out of London, or from sitting uh, in the back of a refueling tanker, you know, watching the SR-71 get refueled. So just, just an epic um, guy, and if you haven't seen his YouTube video that he did with Lawrence Livermore National Labs, I'd highly recommend it. It's super inspiring. So we uh, were so excited, though, to have Juan Brown and Mike Patey out. Mike's, of course, uh, local uh, here on Spanish Fork, but uh, international, internationally known. Um, he did not give me a... Uh, a bio that I could read. So Juan gave me one. I'm going to introduce Juan because he's going to go up first. When Mike gets up, I'm going to read you what ChatGPT said. <laughs> we'll go from there. So the entire focus of this event is aviation safety, and I think the focus in particular is on mountain flying uh, and, and the fact that we're heading towards the winter season. There's been a number of notable crashes lately, and Part of us being safe pilots and aviators is constantly reminding ourselves of the vigilance that we need to have when we're in the air. Um, Juan Brown, I'm excited to have him here. He bought his first aircraft at 15 years old, a 1942 Taylor Craft. He soloed on his 16th birthday, was a private pilot at 17. Um, US Air Force pilot training class of 89 to 04 at Williams Air Force Base, Arizona. He, the T-37, was his first, uh, first assignment instructor, is that right? Um, and uh, he then later flew the C-141 out of Travis, that was strategic airlift. Strategic airlift, and then uh, flew C-130s out of the Nevada Air National Guard, part of the tactical airlift. Uh, he currently flies for American Airlines, started there in 1927, flown the 727, 737, 757, People are laughing. Uh, 767, 777, uh, MD-80, Airbus 319, 320. Uh, current fleet of GA, GA aircraft is his 1997 Avian Husky, uh, A1, a 1946 Piper J3 Cub, and his 1959 C310 Harvey, right? So let's give Juan a huge round of applause and welcome him on up here. And if you want it, Juan, I brought you a little stool. So I got to put, yeah. I'll, I'll put the mirror inside. Uh, no. Hold on. I'll just turn the mirroring, mirroring off. Yeah, I got, that's my mirroring now. Yeah, we need to stop that one for okay. the live stream. Hold on one second. I'm going to swap you here. You got your mic? Hello, testing. Can you hear me now? Well, thanks for the uh, background. I can blow through that real quick. Uh, thanks so much, Mark, for flying us out here to come talk to you all today and setting up this live stream. Today, Mark assigned me three different crashes, local crashes here to discuss, and I'm going to add a fourth one to it. I want to keep it down to about 45 minutes, so Mark, keep me honest on that. 
We're always learning here in aviation. That's why we're here today, to continue to learn from these various accidents. Now, is that, okay, that's connected to that. After looking at these three assignments that he assigned me, these three accidents, that is, happened before the pilot even got in the airplane. These are examples of ADM, or um, risk assessment, aviation decision making, making the right decision before we get into the airplane. Uh, this is a picture of the Aviat Husky. Uh, one of my main points is, in mountain flying, I fly very light. That's, and I learned this from motorcycling, that's 17 pounds worth of gear, and I get into Johnson Creek or up in the Idaho mountains with half tanks of fuel and no passengers in the Husky. So in the Husky, it's a solo operation for me. Keep it light, keep the odds in my favor. I'm on the ground before 12 noon up in the mountains in Idaho, trying to keep the odds stacked in my favor. So the first thing I wanna talk about is did you all hear about the uh, A36 recently from Heber City? The uh, JetBlue pilot, an airline pilot in his general aviation aircraft. This one struck close to home because this kind of fits my profile. You take an airline pilot in a GA aircraft, he takes his girlfriend with him, and he goes to one of my favorite destinations, a destination that I was at just two days ago, Shelter Cove, California. So he launches out of Heber City here a week or so ago, Mountain Airport. He's familiar, flies all the way to Shelter Cove, California, about four and a half hours with his long range fuel tanks in the uh, A36, gets to Shelter Cove and as is all too common there, Shelter Cove is fogged in. So he's got to divert. Garberville, the next closest airport, is fogged in also. And so he elects to go to Round Valley Airport. It is now approaching, um, Sunset. Round Valley Airport is a rough little airport in Northern California that's at the 1400 foot elevation and surrounded by higher terrain. It says on here that there's fuel available, but we're not sure if he was able to get fuel at that airport as we don't know if the fuel island was even working. Investigators will be able to look through his receipts and see if he was able to get fuel or not. So they elect to depart Round Valley Airport. The latest update on this is that the family said that they got a message that they stopped to take a pee break at Round Valley and then continue on. So maybe he did not get fuel. We don't know. And instead of taking off the normal direction at Round Valley would be to take off to the east to avoid the higher terrain. The prevailing wind is typically out of the west. Apparently, this pilot elected to take off to the west, directly into rising terrain, directly into the setting sun, right at sunset. And what happens to you with rising terrain at sunset? It can mask or block or shadow higher terrain that's closer to you. So they found the wreckage of the aircraft after it started about a two acre fire, uh, just on the hills to the west of the airport. So he's stacking the odds against himself. It's single engine uh, at night after a long day of flying. We don't know what the fuel situation is and taking off in the technically the wrong direction into higher terrain. In mountain flying, you often get stuck in a situation where you're forced to use a tailwind takeoff to avoid the terrain. So stacking the odds. Did the engine quit? Was it C-fit? Was it stall spin? We don't know yet. So that's the A36 out of Heber Valley. Does anybody else have any personal information on that accident they could share with us? Know anything about that yet? All right. The next one. This is the... Stand by, let me get the right file here. The Diamond DA40 out of Cedar City, Utah. On April 23rd, 2022, a, 
A DA-40 was destroyed when it was involved in an accident near Cedar City, Utah. The pilot and three passengers were fatally in injured. Part 91. Witnesses traveling near the accident site reported that they observed an aircraft flying in an easterly heading about two to 300 feet above ground level. The airplane did not appear to be in distress. After the airplane passed over the witness's position, the airplane maneuvered as if the pilot was trying to turn it around. He's flying up that Highway 14 ca Canyon we'll look at. The airplane subsequently impacted mountainous terrain about only seven miles southeast of the Cedar City Airport. No problems with the airplane. A review of the weight and balance showed that at the time of departure, the airplane was 128 pounds over max gross weight. The airplane was also outside of its center of gravity envelope. The calculated density altitude at the time of departure at the departure airport was 6,022 feet, density altitude. Everybody knows what density altitude is. You lose performance. You're here in Utah. You deal with it every summer. The calculated climb performance at that density altitude would have been about 300 feet per minute. So the air, the, he attempted a turn in the canyon to escape the rising terrain and stalled it in. If we can get that map up here, uh, he was going right up. Now you guys should be familiar with this here locally. Cedar City, Cedar City Airport located right there. Highway 14, where does that Highway 14 go to? It goes right to the base of Brian's Head, some of the highest terrain around here. So what is the pilot's decision making before he even got in the aircraft? He's in the afternoon, he's loading it up with three passengers, and he's proceeding at a low altitude into rising terrain just stacking the odds against him. Aeronautical decision-making. Control flight into terrain, a perfectly good accident. Density altitude, West Jordan, Utah. <laughs> uh, density altitude, the, the part of uh, the background that uh, was not mentioned was this <laughs> right here. Uh, I bought that airplane in at 15, soloed at 16, got my license in 17, and then wrecked it at 19 in a density altitude accident in Beckworth, California, in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Uh, an old 65 horse, tired old engine. I just bought gas at Frank Nervino's airport and had my buddy with me, and the aircraft refused to remain airborne <laughs> after I took off. And I came back around and smashed it onto the runway and bent the prop and busted the bungee cords off of the landing gear and had to trailer the airplane home because I bent the crankshaft in the process there. So that was the end of that airplane. And that's, <laughs> that lesson in density altitude has stuck with me ever since. I was a brand new pilot of that first 100 hours. What happens to us when we get our pilot's rating? That first 300 hours, that's the most likely time we're gonna have an accident. Accident statistics show that the first 300 hours is a huge range of possible accidents. We don't know what we don't know yet. We haven't learned to respect density altitude. I was confident I could fly that thing in the mountains because I'd been practicing flying with the gliders and catching lift, but it caught me. So that, those accident statistics kind of wave, ebb and flow throughout your career as you grow more experience. But the peaks of those of uh, the statistics of having an accident get le less and less, hopefully, uh, uh, the more experience you get. But each time you switch airplanes, you're kind of back in that first 300 hours again. All right, back to the West Jordan incident. The pilot and five passengers departed on an instrument IFR cross-country flight plan. He was gonna go all the way down to the Grand Canyon and back from West Jordan Airport. You guys are familiar with this airport? It's just south of Salt Lake City. He took off with a tailwind. He wanted to go south. Why is that common practice out at West Jordan to take off to the south? The only reason I would venture to guess is that that um, Class B airspace is just to the north and it goes down to the surface. So maybe he didn't want to mess with that. But for some reason, he elected to go with a seven to 10 knot tailwind and let's see, let me start down here. This is a 
43-year-old pilot with 108 total hours and five hours in this make and model aircraft. It's a Saratoga, so it's, this is his first complex aircraft, retractable gear, constant speed propeller, and he loads this thing up again full of passengers. It's one o'clock in the afternoon and it's hot. It's like 30 degrees Celsius. And again, the density altitude is way up there. Let's just pick it up from right here. A security camera located at Midfield Airport captured the airplane as it lifted off about 3,700 feet from the beginning of the 5,800 foot long runway. So 3,700 feet of takeoff roll with this tailwind. The airplane began a series of shallow climbs and descents that continued until the airplane was no longer visible on the video camera. About one minute and 15 seconds after takeoff, the video captured the airplane again in a descent and a steep angle into a residential neighborhood about a mile and a half from the airport struck a tree in three structures and caught on fire. The density altitude at the time of the accident exceeded 7,200 feet and the airplane was close to its maximum gross weight. It should have been able to climb out at 500 feet per minute. But what they found with the uh, engine data is that the pilot began me missing with messing with the mixture control just prior to the crash. So it appears that this new pilot in this new airplane didn't properly set the mixture on this naturally aspirated engine before takeoff. When you get in these high density altitude situations, you gotta get the mixture correct on the airplane before you blast off down the runway. Apparently he was messing with that, being distracted with that just prior to the crash. There's some inner, there's, there he is departing to the south. A post-accident interview with his wife who survived said that, the, that his husband, the pilot, computed the airplane's weight and balance and showed her the paperwork was all planned out. She indicated the pilot was aware of the high temperatures and high altitude and had assured her that we're all good. The, one, of the, one of his instructors said that during flight training, he handled the airplane easily and without difficulty, but he had reviewed density altitude and, uh, and normally aspirated engines with this pilot multiple times, and the flight instructor stated that the pilot, the accident pilot, didn't understand why he continued to bring up pressure altitude and density altitude as discussion topics. So again, stacking the odds against you. You're a low time pilot, uh, high density altitude, you're picking the middle of the day, uh, hot temperatures, and you're loading the airplane up to the gills, and you don't have a solid understanding of how to lean the mixture before you take off. It's just too many odds stacked against you. Again, another accident that happened before, before they even got into the airplane. Now, let's move on to the PC-12. Wow, this one. You guys remember this one, the, the PC-12 hunting accident uh, in Chamberlain, South Dakota. An overloaded PC-12 crashes in icing conditions on takeoff, immediately after takeoff. In Chamberlain, South Dakota, they were out on a hunting trip. There was a freezing drizzle, snow, icing. The aircraft was parked outside. They had it parked overnight outside. They'd gone on their hunting trip. They came back the next day. The pilot came out three hours prior to try to begin to de-ice the aircraft. Uh, it's an uncontrolled airport. There's an airport manager there with a ladder but they're unable to get to the top of the T tail on the platter, similar to the King Air back there. The, the top of the horizontal tail is too tall. They can't reach it. So there's a pile of snow still on the tail of this PC-12 when they attempt to take off. Let's see if I got some... Uh... Let's 
Here we, can you see that? There's the uh, aircraft starting engines and taxiing out, and note the ice and snow that's still on the tail of the aircraft and the horrible kind of weather conditions that they're dealing with. Let's see if here is the takeoff roll. Snow and hard. The pilot had a tendency and a history of, he's got 2,000 hours total time, about 1,200 hours in the Pilatus. He's got a history of doing an abrupt pull at uh, V1 rotate speed. He yanks it into the air and immediately gets it into, into a left bank and the aircraft begins going through the stick shaker, stall protection systems that are built into the PC-12 and it crashes shortly thereafter. It only makes it up to about 300 feet. In the decision-making part of this, let's see if we can find the... Flight data, uh, the cockpit voice recorder. Okay, there's the uh, tail with the ice on it. Ice on top of the aircraft, the actual accident aircraft. Now, where is the voice recorder? This, by the way, is Carol. This is where I get all these NTSB reports. It's a clumsy system through the NTSB that you can use to search these events out. There, when an accident, uh, well, when these reports come out, the first thing comes, that comes out is a preliminary report that takes about a couple of weeks, just the basic facts that they know. A year or two later, the public docket is released. This is the public docket. This is all the data that they're gonna use in this accident investigation. Then from this public docket, a few weeks or a month later, the NTSB will report their probable cause. Cockpit voice recorder, that's what I want right there. So they're out there working on the airplane and they have this very interesting conversation with the airport manager who's, who's trying to discourage them from taking off at all. It's the airport manager that's attempting with a tractor to plow the field for these guys to blast off on. They get their IFR clearance. They get the engine started. It's an uncontrolled airport. They begin talking to the airport manager on the Unicom. <laughs> and the airport manager says, hey, you got a copy there, Pilatus? Radio one, that's the pilot. This is a single pilot operation. I got a copy. I was gonna go down and back taxi 3-1. Is that gonna work for you? The airport, it don't look good to me. I don't know what you guys are thinking, pilot. Uh, is the runway in good condition? Manager, I'd say I can't hardly keep up. He can't keep up with plowing the snow with the tractor. Pilot, all right, it'll be okay. Five, six kilo Juliet. Airport, what's that? Pilot, ah, we're gonna be just fine. We're gonna back taxi three one and take off out of here. Airport says, okay, the runway is not clear. Radio, I thought, I thought you had, uh, let, me, let me back taxi down and I'll take a look and I'll be back. Airport, you guys are crazy. I got berms on this thing. I gotta get the snow out of here. Pilot one, I wonder what he's been doing out here the last two hours. Airport, that don't look good to me. That's kind of the famous last saying that the co-pilots always say to the, to the captain whenever the situation gets tight because we know the cockpit voice recorder is recording us. So we always want to say, I don't know, captain, it doesn't look good to me. <laughs> Radio one, the, the pilot. I think we're going to be just fine right down this uh, one track we've made, uh, six kilo Juliet Airport. If you guys don't mind problems with throw, plowing through some drifts, because they're going to hit snowdrifts on the way out there. 
pilot one. He's been out here for two hours. In my pickup, I could have had this done in 30 minutes. Pilot one, oh, that's a nice track right there. That's fine. This thing will take off so fast. Uh, the pilot in the other seat, which I don't think is a rated pilot, he says, uh, how much space do you need? Pilot one, I need most of the runway, but uh, I'm all good. If he gave us a decent place to turn around here, so he pumps up the RPM and and then we get the first couple of expletives. Okay, can you hold that? Okay, we're set. Probes on, condition lever, and right away he launches and right away gets into a stall and crashes. So again, another case of basic aeronautical decision making. That crash occurred before those pilots even got to the airplane. How can we begin to talk about the finer points of aviation safety, like AQP, Advanced Qualification Program, airline style training, and migrate that down to general aviation if we're making terrible decisions like this before we even get into the airplane. And this is, how are we doing on time, Mark? All right. Um, why is it that the accident rate is so much greater in general aviation versus airline flying? Well, first off, there's these three different layers of uh, FARs. You've got FAR part 91, that's general aviation. That's the, the regulation that allows us the freedom to enjoy what we do. Part 135, charter type operations, and then part 121, airliner type operations. So over the years, what have airliners, airline operations learned to help prevent accidents? Well, first off, 121 operations. Our safety envelope is this tiny little box. We operate in this tiny little box of safety every day. I do the same thing every time I go to work. I go from LA to Sydney or LA to London. I know that route inside and out. It's the same airplane. It's generally different people each time, but we're all trained to the exact same standards. So any pilot I can fly with it's like flying with any other pilot, minus a few little quirks. <laughs> and so it's a real plug and play system. Over the years, the airlines have, um, well, it took us a long time and not until the 70s before CRM or crew resource management became a thing with the airlines, where you work together as a team. It used to be it was the captain's way and that's it. And that turned out to be fatal, especially in that Tenerife deal I would recommend, uh, that's a whole nother subject. These things that are the biggest distraction and they are death on these things at the airlines today. We're going through the uh, near miss at JFK. Nobody's talking what the hell the distraction was, why that near miss occurred, but we're also getting human factors lectures left and right about turning the damn cell phones off airplane mode, airplane mode, and I'm now promoting the fact that when we come through the airport gates to enjoy a day of flying at the airport, I'm turning the, air, the phone into airplane mode. I want to be on airplane mode so I can focus on the fun of flying 110%, because every time I get to pull in the airplane out of the hangar and start my pre-flight, the damn phone starts blowing up with something's just happened, and now I'm distracted, and before I know it, I'm forgetting stuff, and I'm forgetting camping gear that I need for the whole weekend, and I show up without a sleeping bag, for example, because I answered a phone call. So turn off the phone, put it on uh, airplane mode, and avoid using the phone uh, handheld cameras if you're going to film your flight. Use GoPro-type cameras, fixed cameras. And then brief your passengers. Your, uh, every airline flight, we have a threat forward briefing on every takeoff and every landing. So we're required to brief the departure, brief what we're gonna do in the event of an emergency, and what are the threats out there today. So for example, each of these departures, they could have briefed, the, they could have discussed with somebody the threat that was facing them today. 
icing, density, altitude, high terrain. Get everybody on the same page. Then with your passengers, teach them to look at the engine gauges. Have them back you up on the engine gauges. Have them point something out if they see something on the, on the takeoff roll so you can make the decision whether to reject or continue the takeoff. Make them part of the crew. Teach them how to, how to use the transponder and put the, butt, the numbers in for you. Teach them how to switch radio frequencies. Make them a part of the crew. AQP means that the airlines have taken previous accident histories and then they go through and create a training program developed on or from lessons learned from that accident. And this takes a, years to do. We are still studying accidents that happened, well, for example, the Air France accident that happened so many years ago. They have to get each of their training scenarios um, blessed by the FAA before they can implement those training scenarios into the highly standardized training program at the airlines. But we're always learning from our previous mistakes. In general aviation, how can we do AQP style training? Well, eh. first, stay in your safety box there. And then once you, after a while you start flying GA, you kind of get in a rut and you kind of go to the same airport for lunch every day. Well, expand your horizons gradually but then get out there and continue to practice those maneuvers that you had to learn in the first place. Slow flights, stalls, precision landings, uh, power off 180 degree landings to a spot landing. Get your spot landing skills down. Get your, make every landing a precision landing. Don't accept floating down the runway 1,000 or 2,000 feet. Work on getting that thing down on a point and then work on getting it down, power off safely from a 180 degree base turn. I do not recommend ever practicing the 180 degree turn back to the airport. They call it the impossible turn because it's virtually impossible. If you instead go up overhead the numbers and practice what it takes to glide down from directly overhead the numbers, you'll get a much better idea of how much drag your aircraft produces, how much rate of descent your aircraft produces, at idle power, and remember with the power off, it's going to be even worse. And that's a much safer way of practicing dead stick landings, overhead and a nice 360 degree pattern. And I find in most of my airplanes, it takes not 1,000 feet, but 1,500 to 2,000 feet to safely just glide all the way around and land on the numbers there. Finding a pattern that's clear enough and open enough to do that, it's another story because it gets busy around here and that completely messes up the pattern for everybody else. So that's uh, four recent accidents. That's a little blend of CRM, aeronautical decision making, advanced qualification program type training in the airlines. And uh, we're good on time here. I think that's about right for me and I think we're gonna bring Mike on here and have his discussion on icing and uh, some of the technology that's available today, and then we're going to open it wide open for questions and answers together after Mike's briefing. Big round of applause for Juan Brown. <laughs> and exactly, <laughs> we're going to have him back up here later. We're going to do some Q&A, so whether you're on the live stream and want to send us in some questions there, or uh, if you're here in person, we should be able to float a mic. Let me turn that off. Feedback. Okay, I'm going to introduce Mike Patey, who probably doesn't need much of an introduction, but I'm going to do it chat GPT style here, since he uh, denied the request for a bio. Mike Patey is an aviator, self-taught engineer, experimental aircraft builder, and business person based out of Spanish Fork, Utah. He's known for dramatically customizing the designs and performance of numerous aircraft. Patey has completed 12 aircraft builds. That's wrong, right? 13, 14, whatever. North of that. 12 that chat GPT knew about. Um, through 2019, often improving upon the build with each iteration. Together with his twin brother, Mark Patey, uh, they're the current record holder for the transcontinental flight speed across North America. 
Patey's passion for aviation safety is evident in his YouTube videos at air shows and with any personal interaction. He's inspired many to pursue their dreams of flight and personal aircraft construction. His tagline, what is it? Back to work. That was a little lackluster. What is it? There we go is often repeated in his videos and echoed amongst fans. As a Garmin Aerospace ambassador and close advisor to several aerospace and defense companies, including Pratt & Whitney, Patey has a wealth of experience in aviation, in the aviation industry. His expertise in aircraft design and performance make him an ideal speaker for aviation safety topics. How did ChatGPT do? <laughs> Let's welcome him up here. <laughs> All right, how's this working? It's good. Oh, wow. This is a lot bigger group than I thought I'd been hanging out up front. Okay, let me start by turning off this. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> Airplane mode, right? Okay, how about all the way off? I'll skip airplane mode and go right to off. Um, all right, so I, a lot of you, if you follow my videos, um, you may know that I have no script. I don't plan anything. I just build stuff and talk as I go whenever my buddy Ron points a camera at, camera at me. And uh, I tried several times typing down and writing what I was going to talk about today. And um, I've had a really interesting couple months um, losing some very close friends in aviation. And I struggled and realized I couldn't do it. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to just do what I do in my videos. I'm going to come up and talk about airplanes, talk a little bit about engineering, talk about what's happening in general aviation and, and why I feel like we're losing too many of us. And uh, so this is me officially, no plan, talking about airplanes, and we'll see how it goes. So all right, guys, first of all, this is the Utah community, so I'm going to kind of base this a little bit on the engineering of flying around the Utah Rocky Mountains. I'm going to tell you a couple of stories, and I'm going to talk about a little bit about DA, and also as we're moving into the winter months about icing, and we'll kind of end up there. So first of all, we're past the summer months, but real quick, I want to touch base and tell you one brief story, and I want to keep them a little more positive as it's been a very difficult few months for me in aviation. Um, so uh, aviation, we up here in the high mountains, we call this the high desert, the DA is really high. On the engineering side, most of you always, you understand it, you read it in books, you look at your charts, you see these lines. There's this line that not many people really talk about. You kind of got this interpolation where you can open up your book and you see density, altitude, weight, performance, and you can do this simple math. And what they don't show you on the end of that chart is that line does not stay constant. As you are losing horsepower and increasing weight and DA is coming up, that line, if you were to continue it, starts to go straight vertical where engineering uh, and physics and math suddenly come fully into play and we lose our pilots. And uh, if you fly within this perfect envelope, you're in good shape. Unfortunately, we have a lot of people that have flown in that book and that envelope and that space uh, for so long and they just happen to live on the other side of the country. And out here in the Rocky Mountains, we call them the Flatlanders. Great, awesome pilots that have opened up their book as much as the rest of us and studied those charts for every takeoff and landing, and maybe at some point they stopped because they know their airplane, they know the flying characteristics, and they know what that chart looks like. And then those flatlanders come out here to Utah, where the high mountain desert. It looks and feels like we're down low because the mountains are towering 12,000 feet up. Um, so it feels like we're still flatlanders. We're starting here at 4,525 feet and going up from there. Density altitude of this field is upwards of 7,000, 8,000 feet in the summer. And if you're going up to any of these mountains, you start approaching 10, 12,000 feet. Some of the places some friends and I go land, we are upwards of 16, 17,000 feet DA. 
um, to land. Well, unfortunately, we tend to lose people every summer um, due to that density altitude. They, they forget that that book that they haven't looked at on weight and balance, um, that they're now in a territory that they have never experienced in their entire lives. And they enter these canyons, and uh, a very recent one, they entered the canyon, and when they went in the canyon, they had about 10 minutes that they had no idea that the second they made that turn, they were never coming out. There was no shoulda, woulda, coulda <clears throat> after the turn inbound. <clears throat> I went up to the site, as I'm on search and rescue, and helped participate with the aircraft, finding the aircraft and removal of the aircraft. Um, the problem is they're so far outside of what they flew for 20 years that they didn't know that that mountain is going to have a downdraft that's going to add this new element. The extra people they had adds, adds a new element. And the only way out is the way they came in. And the turn bank they need to make that exit increases their stall speed beyond return. They literally could have flown in that canyon 10 times that day and died 10 times in a row once they turned inbound. And um, it's a horribly sad outcome. And we're losing too many because I've now gotten to the point where my twin brother and I say, oh my gosh, did you hear? We lost another flatlander or a new pilot that probably felt 100% certain that that chart they looked at continued like this, but it gets to a point where it no longer is feasible. So be careful. Um, I have a, experience, a, a personal experience where um, I second-guessed a decision I made on a flight with some buddies in all bush planes. I've never told this story. Um, we uh, had a big group of us, five aircraft, uh, one pilot, uh, thousands of hours, all in a plane he had been flying, once a bush plane, for a long period of time. We went up in the high mountain desert, he was from back east, and uh, we went into a, an airstrip and uh, told them, hey, you shouldn't come land on this one, it's a bit tight, uh, if you haven't done it before, we're just going to turn around, take back off, let's go. He came around and he landed, and uh, him and his buddy. And I started looking at the plane and doing some just rough math in my head, which is what I love to do. And I went over to him and I said, hey, you know what, let's, let's throw him in, it was Draco at the time, let's throw him in Draco. It, it has a little less concern about the extra weight and I can come out of here pretty heavy, and we got lots of spare room. And he says, no, I'm 100% fine. And I said, oh, you know, it's pretty tight. I think, let's just do it. You're probably right. You're 100% fine. Let's, 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 uh, let, let's just throw him in mine. Maybe he wants to ride mine anyway. And he, he piped up and goes, no, 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 it's, it's great. We're talking. We're having fun together. We're flying out here as a group, blah, blah, blah. So I backed off, and I paced which I do all the time. I'm having a hard time holding steel right here on the stage because I'm a pacer. Uh, and I'll try and speed this up. I, he was about ready to take off, and I went over and said, you know what, I, I'm going to hurt this guy's feelings, but I'm taking that guy out of the back of that plane. And uh, I went over and I said, I'm really sorry. I, I, please don't take offense to this. I'm sure you know your plane. I'm sure you know that you feel like it gets off in 300 feet. This isn't a problem. I am not okay with this. And I looked at his passengers. I said, would you please, please jump in my airplane? And he, for the first time, saw probably that I was scared. I was not feeling good. And he got out and got in the plane, and we took off. Now, a couple hundred pounds may not sound a lot, but in a bush plane on a high desert, it is a lot of difference for a couple hundred pounds. He got out. We took off, and I'm, I'm airborne, <clears throat> and we're, and I have a, a video of this. I, I won't show it because I love this guy, and, and I, I don't want to do that, but 
this guy took a picture, to, a video of his buddy lifting off. And we watched him go down this dirt strip and dust going everywhere, and he didn't lift, and he didn't lift, and he didn't lift. And as he got to the end, he pulled up and started mushing at, right at a giant grove of trees. And he took the bush tires and tail through the tops of those trees for more than 150 feet and flew out. And he's, now that the story ends, everyone <laughs> went home. The, the problem here is, <clears throat> I know when early flying, I was a bit more of a cowboy. And I have, uh, I crossed the line when I shouldn't have crossed the line and people need me to come home. My family counts on me, my wife counts on me, my kids count on me. And I have a whole bunch of my aviation family right here that I want to keep making silly videos for because they seem to like them. So um, over the years, I've pulled back those, those margins. Every single year, I pull back further. My brother Mark and I now have all kinds of new policies we've pushed over the years and said, not doing that. Now, night flying needs to be turbine, a twin, or a parachute. I need some kind of backup. We have a policy, I'm gonna, I wasn't going to talk about this, but <clears throat> we have a three strikes you're out. Maybe people have heard this before or, or, or done it. My three strikes are now anything is a strike and I don't fly. And that could mean that a instrument that is non-critical to flight that's 100% legal for you to fly without isn't functioning. Strike one. Why do I make that a strike? Because I should have that thing fixed, so I need to strike. Guess what? Nighttime. Beautiful. Stars are out, sky, everything's perfect, smooth sky. It would be a beautiful night flight. It's nighttime. That's a strike. Two things that are totally non-critical. And it can be anything. I, I didn't get enough rest. I'm a little tired. Strike three. Anything can strike out. And Mark and I started realizing we were not, we were choosing not to fly a lot. And then forcing ourselves to fix little items on the airplane about the rest of the night before, about, about what we did in decision making. And I believe that's why I'm talking to you guys today. I, uh, I lost an engine in my Lance Air Legacy on the way to Oshkosh. What people don't know is that I was scheduled to be there for an event the day before. And work ran a little long, and so I was going to leave at night. Strike one. Um, the weather was mild at best, but there was a tiny bit of weather. Could have flown through it, over it, strike two. And I was, believe it or not, I was tired. I had run, run, I don't sleep a lot anyway, and I run on an abnormally low amount of sleep, and I'm working on trying to be better at that, but I was a little bit tired. And I, that night, called up people that were counting on me to be at Oshkosh the day before for an event. And I said, guys, I can't come. Oh, is something wrong with the plane? No, the plane's fine. Something wrong, I said, what's up? And I said, I have a three strike policy and I striked out. I'm not going. So I canceled an event, I let people down and that's hard on me because I hate doing that. And uh, got up the next morning and took off on that flight on a beautiful day and then that engine quit. That engine, if you just were to look at the math, really just was a ticking clock. There's nothing the way I flew it, nothing about anything I was doing. It was a tired engine, should have been overhauled. We can't wait to see what the history was on it. It still had time left. It wasn't like a past time engine that shouldn't be flying. It just had a history that isn't documented like the new aircraft where it tattletales when you do things wrong. And that engine quit on me. That engine would have quit on me in that little bit of weather at night about the same location. Now, maybe I could have made it, maybe I couldn't. But I tell you what, when an engine goes off and shrapnel takes out your plane 
and the, air, the cabin fills with smoke, and oil blasts over your windscreen, add night to that element, and dead stick, 40 miles, in IMC, for an own made up spiraling descent to an airport, and then try and find that runway in the black, to line up with whatever all those lights are you're gonna try and hit, I don't know. I don't know if I could have done it. So three strikes, you're out. So let's talk about this time of year, guys. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a little emotional, and I, I hope, and I'm normally just super happy, um, but it's, they asked me to talk about aviation safety right in the middle of one of my hardest losses of uh, friends in aviation. So I'm going to be a little bit <laughs> emotional about this topic. All right, let's talk about the, the icing. We're here in Utah. We live in these high mountains. We talked about DA. Be careful, guys. Let me end right here. Density altitude will kill you if you don't respect it and then know that there are things out here and rollers and downdrafts that will surprise you. And if you think you're, and if you're flying near the edge, you'll probably be okay for a while. One day it will take you out and whoever you chose to put in the seat with you. So don't do it. So just be really careful, guys. Um, I was talking about icing because icing, we're getting into the winter. There's three different kinds of ice on aircraft. I'm gonna talk more about general, to the general aviation pilots out here Airliners, they really got it good. They got the, one of the, the greatest icing systems in the world. They're running off the, the bleed air heat, heating up the wings. It's always running. It's always shedding. It can take on unbelievable amounts of ice. Um, they still avoid weather, but it has a great system. What are we flying for icing? A lot of us don't have any de-ice at all. Just stay out. Like, just don't play with it. Just stay out. Just run like it's there to kill you because if you don't run often enough, it will. So uh, the two other systems that general aviation is most people use, there's electro explosive, there's electric heat, but what most people are flying is, is TKS and boots. So I'm gonna talk, tell you a couple stories. So TKS, a lot of you flying serious understand this, you got a certain amount of fluid, you pump it into the wing, it's coming out little teeny tiny pinholes. Here's the problem with TKS, and this is not derogatory, I'm just talking about the physics of, of what's going on. Those holes are so small <clears throat> that if you go into icing inadvertent and at night, one of your strikes, weather strike, but if you happen to go into weather and you haven't pre-turned on your TKS, it will plug the holes. I did a series of testing when I first got the TKS in a Cirrus, I've had several Cirruses, and it's an amazing system. And if the wing is really wet, does a pretty good job of shedding off light icing. It's not great at shedding off heavy icing, and all aircraft have problems with that. But here's the gamble. Maybe certified to go in, but you're playing this game of I have a certain amount of fluid, and I don't want to turn it on when I don't need it, but if I don't turn it on before I need it, I plug up a bunch, bunch of holes and I got videos of my plane where we had beautiful warm air below uh, where we could melt it off, we'd climb up high and we'd go up IFR and I chose this IFR route back and forth and we'd go in and watch it and play with it and then come back and melt it off and go back, just light icing. And uh, here's what we found. If the wing is dry, it will ice up and then all the fluid is gonna go the path of least resistance, it's gonna come out all the other holes. Well, now you got a wing with ice over here, a little ice over there, a little back and forth. Guys, it's an ice system for the time you chose not to fly, you checked the weather, or you chose to fly, but you checked the weather, you felt it was good, it shouldn't have icing, but icing changed along your route, temperature changed, now you have it. Don't go in it. Icing, de-icing systems should only be for the surprise, not because I have it and I'm going to use it. It will get you in trouble. Your stall speed is going to go up. Um, the other kind of de-ice, uh, and then also, obviously, you know, you guys, you have a certain time limit on that ice. So if you get in something you can't get out, it's going to be a mess. So uh, just be careful. Boots are great. A lot of people, um, boots have been around forever. I think it's, uh, you have unlimited. Pop it, shed it, just keep popping that. 
Uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit, a little story about, uh, I'm going to tell you two stories, both of uh, uh, me and my brother involved in one and, and then me and another. Um, boots, boots uh, let me skip past Boots, let me go to an airplane. Mark and I were flying on the northwest coast. And we were in a 421. Both these stories have my 421 involved. I had that many, many years ago. I flew, I don't know, a thousand hours on it. Um, this is pre all the new technology. This goes way back, old, old school VOR flying. Um, we are flying up high, pressurized, above the weather, and all of a sudden we hear a radio call um, asking ATC for help. And uh, said, we're icing up, we're in trouble. We need to get out. And uh, I'll shorten it up. There's a longer version um, my brother uh, talks about and uh, put in a book. But we hear this guy with a panic in his voice call out, and ATC's, what do you need? He says, I need lower. I'm picking up ice. I need to get down. So ATC lowers him down. And, and uh, he calls out and says, hey, I need lower. I'm having a hard time keeping the plane up. I think I'm in trouble. And ATC calls out that phrase that I've heard before, which is a really hard phrase, phrase to hear when you're the pilot. How many souls on board that aircraft? And it was a Cessna 172, said four souls on board. And, uh, and then he keys back up and he says, I can no longer hold altitude, I've got too much ice, I'm going down. Now my brother and I are sitting above this weather, smooth sky, clear sky, stars, beautiful, and we're just listening to this unfold for a way too long amount of time. And it's just heartbreaking. Every second seemed like an hour. And then uh, ATC says, uh, uh, well, I, if you turn this way, um, I can give you lower. He's in the mountains. So he turns this heading. And he says, okay, go lower. And uh, on one of the mic ups, you hear a stall horn buzzing. And you got four people in an airplane, you're icing up and you're asking to go lower because the airplane's not keeping up and then you're up in the air above it listening and you hear a stall horn going off. It is the most heart-wrenching thing you can ever hear. And then the guy goes, Roger, going down. And gives him another vector. And then he gets to this point where ATC says, you're going to be dropping out of radar contact and you're in mountainous terrain. I'm gonna give you one more heading and wish you the best of luck because I'm not gonna have radar contact or radio contact. Now, that guy is in a non-de-ice aircraft in the mountains with four people at night and uh, he has no more options. He's just like the guy flying into a canyon that the second he turned in, he was never coming out. And uh, fortunately, because I gotta have a good story because I'm such a downer, all of a sudden we hear shortly after this mic go up and we hear all this screaming. You know, at first we thought it was like, we're gonna crash. And it was like, we made it, we're under the clouds, the ice is coming off, we can see the city. And it was just like, it ended, just like that. Like everybody's going home to their family. And the, Mark and I are up there just like, oh, you know, wipe the sweat off, we're dying, you know. But guys, this incident that Mark and I listen to is happening every day. We just heard stories of people that didn't go home. Those are the ones you guys are hearing about. The ones that everyone passed away on. You guys were making a lot of bad choices and I right here will say I have made enough. I hope to not make any more. And I hope to focus more on aviation safety because I would bet that almost every pilot in this room has said, you know what, that wind was awesome. And I kicked my rudder and I leaned my aileron and man, I just greased it in and that unbelievable wind, I'm an awesome pilot. The other side of that story is this guy. That wind was too much. It was beyond me, it was beyond my airplane. 
and I crashed. The difference from, I'm an awesome pilot, man, I stuck that landing in this crazy wind, feel good about yourself, and the I totaled the aircraft and families didn't go home, is that close. It's that close. I would love to hear everyone say, gosh, it was dead calm, skies were blue, beautiful flight, I greased it in, and if I didn't, everyone has a right to make fun of me because there was not an ounce of wind. And then bounce it, and it's okay. We're, all, we're, we're good with that. But guys, these decisions are happening every day, and we're losing our pilots every single day. There's things you can control, and there's things you cannot control. I'm going to tell you two, two things, one, two, two more stories, and I'm going to end it. Uh, one with me, one with my brother. So I'm going to go to the second story on icing, just because it's winter flying, we need to be safe. All those years ago, two decades ago, I'm flying this 421. It doesn't have onboard weather. It doesn't have anything. It didn't even have a GPS. If that doesn't age me a little or, or let you know my budget at the time was slightly different, I had no GPS in the aircraft at all. We're talking old school Loran stuff. You check the weather in advance, you make the best decisions possible, you fly. Weather systems weren't as good back then, things change, storms creep up. Coming back, night, flying a 421, coming into Provo City Airport over here, Weather was supposed to be good with light scattered small pockets. Now, we don't hear the stories we used to hear, hangar chat guys, go back 20 years, a lot of younger guys in here, the older guys will know what I'm talking about. The new technology, we know where the weather is. If, every, if you don't have it on your plane, some kind of a Garmin or any kind of product that's telling you what the weather is, where it is in real time, just get it, because it's just silly not to. It's the cheapest, safest thing you can do. We didn't have that option at the time. You checked the weather five hours in advance, and you took off. You did a five-hour leg, and you landed home. So I'm coming back on the three-and-a-half, four-hour leg. And we have this, this thing that old, older pilots used to talk about, which was the surprise icing, where it's supposed to be good. It looks good. If there is any moisture, it's tiny pockets, and the weatherman was wrong really, really, really wrong. And on that flight, you found something that just about wiped you out of the sky. Well, I had one of those. I flew all the way home, perfect. Start doing approach, and I'm dropping through this canyon over here, coming into Provo. And right as I start dropping in, I hit icing that was like nothing I have ever experienced then, which has only been a few years, and nothing I have ever experienced since, because I run so far away from that stuff, I, I can't even tell you. And I hit icing that felt like I was being shot at with a 150 caliber guns. I mean, it was just pelting the aircraft. I kick on everything, I already had, kick on all the DI systems, and the boots are, for the most part, I'm pretty proud of it. Like, it's shedding, and all I gotta do is get from that mountain to that airport. I'm almost home. This is a short flight. There's no diversion. There's no nothing. I'm on an approach. I'm going to land the airplane. Sure don't like this crap. Well, I start noticing that my airspeed is dragging. I start pushing up power. And it keeps dragging. I get over here to Fairfield. And I look down. And instead of doing an approach, um, my power is at top of green. Both engines are all the way up. And I'm barely holding airspeed, but my wings are looking pretty good. Like, what is going on? Like, in my mind, I'm thinking, something's wrong with my engine, something's wrong with my plane. <laughs> I didn't put out my flaps, I didn't put out my gear. I'm just coming over Fairfield. What is happening? And uh, I realized there's got to be ice somewhere I'm not seeing that's on this aircraft. And I started finishing the approach, and on the rest of the approach, I start making the DME arc inbound for your, old, the, your newer pilots. You may not fly many of those, but a DME arc is always fun in hard IMC when your plane doesn't want to fly with no GPS. You're spinning dials, your hand flying, and doing an arc in. 
and I get to where I'm turning final to keep the airplane alive, my throttles are to the stop and both engines are into the red. Full takeoff power over the top, over the gate, because if I don't, this plane is coming down, no question. I have no gear out, no flaps out yet, and I am over the top on this 421, light load. And so I'm coming down final, and I go, whatever I'm packing on this aircraft is so draggy and so heavy, I'm coming in hot. I got a big runway, and I am not going to use that white art for nothing. Blue line, let's stay way above it. And uh, fortunately, I, I didn't die. I'm here. I, when I got down and touched that runway, um, this loud crash happens, and the airplane just goes boom like this. I'm on the runway going, what, what just happened? I'm instantly, instinctively kicking the rudder, trying to, thinking I'm, something's going on, and straighten it back up, the plane's just like this on the runway. Taxi off, I'm like, hey, that, that's the worst icing I've ever experienced. Out of nowhere, surprised us. We don't get those super crazy surprises because none of us would fly into a dark purple thing labeled with hell and spinning circles on our cool new instruments that we didn't have back then because that would be a really bad idea because you die. Um, I didn't die. I got off the runway. Stop. No tower. I look. I climb out of the plane. I'm. What happened to my gear? Like, is it folded halfway under? Is it like what's going on? I look. I look down. <clears throat> One wing is clear up because the gear is full high, and the other wing is clear down on the ground because the gear is full squat. The boots look pretty good but the underside of the plane on some of the draggy areas had started catching ice and picked up what I estimate to be several thousand pounds of ice on a 421. Now 421 is a heavy hauling packing monster. There wasn't many people in the plane and I'm on low on fuel and that thing did not want to fly. I had thousands of pounds of ice on my aircraft. One wing, when I landed, dropped it all on the runway. And the other wing hung on to it and just tipped the gear, squatted on one side to the ground, the other one up light. And uh, we ran out and took off chunks of ice that big off that 421. If I had been not on final approach and that hit me out there, it's one of those surprise ones that we used to read about not as much now where the plane went into heavy icing and they didn't come out. So guys, icing is real. Even if your plane is built for it, which the 421 was, it doesn't mean it can handle anything Mother Nature can throw at you. It will take your wings off. It will take your plane down. It will stop flying. You will not have a choice. And I don't care how maverick or top gun or awesome you are, you're, you're now at the mercy of Mother Nature and that aircraft and the engineering that goes behind it. So um, be careful, make smart choices, stay out of that stuff. If you can fly in the daytime, fly in the daytime. If you can just take away what he mentioned just before me, it's usually a series of things. Take them all off the table. Don't, don't, don't think about it, don't question it. Now here's another last story and then I'm gonna end it, guys. This one, sometimes there's things that's out of your control or could be in your control, but it's hard to catch. I almost lost my twin brother, Mark, many years ago. We both had a few experiences. This one, I can honestly say, I don't feel was any decision making on his part. Sometimes things are just out of your control. Maybe an engine failure, you know, is out of your control. But what was the weather, the light, daytime, those are in your control, and so you have a chance of gliding out and landing. Well, my brother Mark uh, got a call from a friend and says, hey, I need to get to an event. Can you fly me and my buddies in this aircraft? It's one of our airplanes as a favor. We love to do favors. Anything to fly, we're in. So we get down, and this guy shows up with a bunch of, bunch of boxes of uh, brochures to go to a, an event. And Mark says, well, how many guys do you got? And he goes, well, I brought a couple more guys. It's going to be four. It's going to be six now. So well, that's every seat full. They're all big guys. Mark's like, 
well, we can't take the boxes. Simple. It's physics, math, engineering, right? Boxes are out, or those two guys are out. We're absolutely not going to happen. And uh, the guy's like, well, we have to have them. We have to have them. We have no other options. Says, nope. So Mark helped him take the boxes that had been packed out and packed them over and said, find someone to drive them to the event you're going to have to do without brochures. Well, got everything ready, got the guys loaded, pre-flight, weight and balance, they're good to go. My brother Mark gets going down the runway and uh, st start seeming like it's taking a little longer. He's like, well, it's warm, a few big guys, I'll be off shortly. And he takes him a little longer, but everything says he's got all kinds of safety margin. That's here at this airport right here on this runway. And he lifts off and it starts to fly, but it just doesn't want to do really well. And now he's at the point of no return, and the fence is coming. And his stall horn's going off, and he's holding the nose down, he's trying to build speed, and he's telling me the story like nothing is making sense. This plane should be flying, it should have tons of power, it should have margin. And he melted it all the way out, trying not to make a turn um, at 10 to 50 feet a minute and sometimes sinking at 50 feet a minute. And finally got up on step to where he could get the plane moving fast and uh, get the plane stable and then return to find out what's wrong with this aircraft. He landed the airplane looked around and said, guys, I don't know what's going on. And then he saw the expression on a couple of the guys' faces. And he says, what aren't you telling me? And one of the guys says, I'm so sorry. I don't know how you got the plane back. I thought I had just killed all my friends. He says, what's going on? He says, when you went in to the restroom, before we took off, I told the guys to help me load all the brochures back in the aircraft and we hit it with our jackets. That plane was so AFCG, I don't know how the thing stayed aloft. So overloaded, you never want to hit a bump, might not keep the wings on it. Guys, Mark is a sharp guy. <laughs> He's awesome, and he still kicks himself today about that flight. He says, I went to the bathroom. I should have gone back and ch double-checked the luggage to see if someone did more. And I'm like, how do, you, how do you beat someone who's lying to you when you already took it out and said, like, ha sometimes things are out of your control. So here's what we need to think about, guys. There's a lot in our control and there's a lot that is out of our control. The stuff that's out of our control, we can't plan for it. If someone sneaks hundreds of pounds into the furthest back of an airplane and lies to you about it after you took it out and returned it, that might be out of your control. If you find icing that was never supposed to be there, that might be out of your control. But if you chose to take off at night with weather or heavy load, or into the mountains, or terrain you haven't been to, or an airport you never landed at, and anything that can add up strikes, and all those things are in your control, take them off the table. I have done things in aviation years ago that make me sick. I'm ashamed of the choices I made in my earlier flying. And I am fortunate enough to still be here with my family. And I'm, I am here speaking after losing four of not just my fellow aviators. We've lost way more in the last two months. Four of my flying friends in two months that I fly with. 
and I lost an engine in an aircraft and was fortunate enough to get it down. And my friend Creighton King that I lost just before Reno was my business partner. The four friends I'm talking about are the guys I call to go play with. And they all stopped flying or flew west in the last 60 days. And I'm not, and I'm struggling with it, guys. I have flown one plane since losing my friend. And one time up in my helicopter. And it soothes me. But I am struggling, guys. We need to stop dying. Stop making bad choices. Because I love aviation and I'm not giving up on it. But it is a hard time and I'm really sorry that my super excitement of aviation is on a low right now. But I tell you what, if my friend Creighton were standing right here, he would tell you guys to freaking get up and he would crack a joke and make you laugh and say, go fly but make good choices. Because aviation makes us happy, and every time we get two inches off the ground, we are alive. We are doing things that almost no one in the world ever gets to do. And it is magical, and it is amazing. But we need to take a hard look at ourselves and stay home when there are any little things so that the day that the things you can't control sneak up, you get to fly right through them and get it on the ground, go high five your friends, and hug your families. I love you guys, I love aviation. Let's be safer, let's do better, let's tell our friends to make better choices, let's make our own better choices. And when we land that really awesome crosswind, I kick butt, you wanna high five your friends landing, at least High five your friends and then pause long enough to say, should I have been in the air at all to have such a cool landing that I get to high five my friends about I, all my rudder, all my aileron and greased it in? Maybe you shouldn't have been up. I'm not saying you should or shouldn't, but I want you to ask that question. Did I make a bad choice to get me into this super cool landing? Anyway, I'm going to leave it at that. I love you guys. I love aviation. Don't give up on it. Let's just keep more of you around and more of the rest of our family around. Thanks so much. Back to work. Thank you, Mike. Okay, we're going to get some chairs up here for okay. Q&A. Let's do it. Okay, what awesome remarks here from both Mark or Mike and, and Juan. We're going to get these chairs up for a QA. and a um, As a housekeeping item, how many of you have not gotten food yet? We know that there's still a crew. One, two, three, four, five, six. Maybe 15, I'm guessing. And we've got a bunch over here on the table. So let's get that. We're going to move this podium here. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Good job. Love you, buddy. I'm going to make a, a couple of remarks here. Thanks. You know, when you think about, you guys trying to pull this off? When you think about everything that they shared today, I don't know that there was anything that was earth shattering, right? As pilots, we get taught all of this stuff in our basic training. We get instructed on all the uh, fundamentals of aviation and best practices. We get tested against it. Um, I love the new FAA um, uh, training that, that puts us in real world pilot decision making scenarios uh, to sort of test like what are you going to do in these situations and yet 
we, we get trained on how to answer those questions to pass our pilot's exam. And often as we get out flying, we start slowly starting to push the envelope past what we would have ever done in a check ride or something like that if we were answering the questions the right way. Uh, in my own life, my wife Amber, I owe a lot to her <clears throat> in terms of my focus on aviation safety. I'm a younger pilot. I bet I'm probably one of the least experienced ones in the room. Um, but when I started flying, one of her requests was, I want you to report on every uh, plane crash that happened in Utah. And I want to be able to ask you about it and you give me an explanation. That's how I got to know Juan Brown here, right? I would go sneak out, watch his videos and come back and act like I knew what I was talking about. Um, but the power of it was it brought to my mind all these themes. Um, there was another great book I read by Paul Craig called The Killing Zone. Show of hands, how many have read that book? It, it's a really fascinating book. He's a professor up at Utah State in their aviation department, if I remember right. And he analyzed what was sort of the difference statistically between GA pilots and airline pilots and why, why are GA pilots having more crashes. And, you know, over time in discussions with my wife, it was like one pilot versus two pilots, uh, one engine versus two engines. Uh, it was the amount of recurrent training that you get. It was the discipline in the airlines of weight and balances, literally right before takeoff, every single flight, the weather discipline, everything. There was just all these things that are just super um, structured and disciplined that creates uh, what we have today, which is one of the safest aviation uh, records in history in the Part 121 world that our, our commercial airline and it, uh, stuff live in. Um, so to me, um, that was a huge inspiration to try to apply that in my own flying. And then I had another uh, local aviator here, Brad Brown on the field, who I know Mike knows and, and a lot of us in this room here know. But he's been one of my mentors. And one of his comments to me uh, was, Mark, if you're going to be a pilot, be a professional pilot or don't be a pilot. And his whole mindset was just, just focus on trying to be as professional as possible. So, um, But it, I really loved having both Mike and Juan out here to, to share their passion of aviation, to talk about these fundamentals here. So we're going to do a Q&A. And we need your help for this, right? We've got some questions that have come in through the live stream. We're going to start with those. But if you've got a question right now that you can think of, we've got a roaming mic. Throw your hand up just so we can um, sort of line you up. But we're going to start with a question, question for Juan that came in. And let me just see here. For Juan, uh, this is from uh, Mr. KC10 on the live stream. Uh, what is his top three recommendations regarding safety for the single engine GA community with regard to currency, proficiency, and training? Well, that's it, currency, proficiency, and training. <laughs> he answered his own question. Uh, one of the hardest things for us to do in GA is to fly enough. If we buy our own airplane, you need to fly that airplane about 100 hours a year to even justify owning the darn thing. So many airplanes sit around and don't get flown. So you gotta remain current, proficient, go out and fly. Stay in the books, keep studying. And as I mentioned before, go out there and practice. Continue to practice those maneuvers that you've learned. Don't get stuck in the rut of just going somewhere for lunch uh, all the time. But go out there and practice your maneuvers. Stalls, falls, and spot landings, short field landings. Awesome. Mike, you wanted to add anything to that? No, I, I think you hit it spot on. I think uh, the only other thing it, that I would add to that is a self-check. Um, mental check uh, on where you are, on your health, your sleep, your personal life, and then um, make sure that you're going out, like Juan said, your phone off, are you, are you completely clear? Are you mentally as clear as turning your phone off as far as that distraction of other distractions in your life? Because uh, I, I had a friend tell me that he, almost died because he was distracted mentally on a personal matter at home. And uh, I, I don't have time for that story, but check yourself mentally. You yeah. need to be prepared. So the I'm safe checklist, you know, running through yep. that. 
Um, one of the things I know I experience, uh, speaking of distraction, I, I'm a business owner. A lot of my use in the aircraft is flying to business meetings, stuff like that. And it's hard sometimes to not be thinking ahead to the meeting when I got to fly the aircraft and, and be present at hand, which is why I often fly with the second pilot for those things, almost always. Okay, we got another question here. Robert asked, um, or sorry, Timmy, I'm going to uh, mention here, he says, does, does he, uh, do you guys find flying stick and rudder helps with flying big iron? So as you guys fly larger aircraft, you know, does the cub flying you do, Mike or Juan, does that stuff help improve what you're doing in larger aircraft? It does. Uh, flying the Boeing 777 from LA to Los Angeles, <laughs> our flying skills are atrophying at an alarming rate. We will hand fly the aircraft to maybe as little as one or 2,000 feet, and it's highly recommended that we get the autopilot on. We are automation managers flying the big aircraft. Coming into land, it's recommended that we keep the autopilot on, manage the automation all the way down until I break out of the weather and I can see the runway, or about 1,000 feet, or maybe 2,000 feet tops. Out of a 30-hour flight, I'm getting just minutes of, of hand flying uh, opportunity there. And besides, if you hand fly the aircraft much, the 777, it's just not much to it. It's just a big video game and you're just putting the flight directors uh, in the correct spot and that's about it. Auto throttles are doing a lot of the work for you. So <laughs> we had an interesting argument on, <laughs> on a flight just recently. The, the FO in the right seat wanted to kick the autopilot off at the top of descent and the captain, <laughs> being sarcastic, he says, oh yeah, right, we should have never put autopilots in these airplanes. We always hand fly them. No, put the autopilot back on. And then I piped in and said, if you want to hand fly these things, go get your own aircraft and keep your hand skills up by flying your own airplane. So. Yeah, I, um, I had an experience. Um, I love hand flying. I, I actually, my 421 I talked about, um, I hand flew everything. The autopilot was not very trustworthy in that aircraft and constantly was going in the shop and and uh, so I, I learned to hand fly steam gauges was my crash roots for thousands of my hours was all steam gauges and no GPSs. And uh, I can tell you that staying proficient in your hand flying skills, stick and rudder, all the basics is really critical. Um, and I can think of one experience to be fast, but I was coming back from Mexico in one of my jets, uh, fully loaded took off, bumpy, but uh, just uh, return flight home, twin engine, comfortable, safe. And then autopilot died on me coming back from Mexico. And I hand flew in the flight levels to stay above the weather. And then it turned into moderate turbulence. And the last several hours was at night. And uh, a lot of those flights in Mexico, you have no radio communication for periods of time and you really have not a lot else going on. And I can tell you right now that it was nice to know that when that plane rocked and tipped and that I instinctively was pushing rudder, aileron control and holding for four hours, um, hand flying in, in turbulence. That's exhausting. And I think basic stick and rudder is gonna help you keep that plane upright if you ever have to do that. I don't recommend it. It was a long flight, <laughs> it's a really long flight going, I got a whole 50 feet or less <laughs> in turbulence, but anyway. One of the things I heard uh, that I thought was just a great recommendation is some of the newer aircraft, uh, Cirrus and other stuff, a lot of people, they'll get up 400 feet and press the autopilot on. And uh, somebody said, no, just always fly it to top of uh, your top of climb and just get in the habit of uh, flying that up there. Okay, what other questions? Do we have any in the audience here? Yep, Roger, one up here. Roger, what do you got? You can yell it out. So Roger's asking, how do I go about um, 
doing these accident investigation videos. Uh, there's so much information out there on the internet today. First, I had to break down this huge barrier, this huge uh, stigma of let's wait till the final report. There, anything else is speculation. Well, I say baloney. There's a lot of information out there now, and we can share the facts as we know them now and can begin to start reminding people and learning lessons right away. So, um, I start with something like the Aviation Safety Network. Boom, they've got the facts there, and usually they've got some good links. In those links may be the ADSB data, FlightAware. Boom, let's take a look at that. Uh, FAA database, uh, pilot pilot's records. Mm, and then there's usually, nowadays, with so much video coverage, cell phone coverage, there's usually video evidence of something that's happened. So lots of real-time video evidence or uh, pictures of what has happened. So between those different sources, all begin to put that together and just try to get to out a preliminary report of just the facts that we know so far. And then I'll go in and say, without speculating, instead I'll, I'll phrase it that this is what investigators will be looking for and go into some of the various possibilities of what could have caused that accident. Then we'll get, months later, we'll get a public docket that's a lot of work to wade through page, thousands of pages of public docket and pull good information from that to do a video report. And then shortly after the public docket will be the NTSB final report. But that's two years down the road. And there are some obvious answers that we could have spoke to right after the accident happened. So that's kind of part of the philosophy behind it and the process that I go through. And the workflow is quick. You can tell by my crappy editing skills, it's like I'll wake up in the morning, there's a story, I'll research it, and then I'll put, uh, put stuff to camera. I will only film, I will edit as I film, and usually right there at the desktop at home, and I will usually will have it up by 2 o'clock that afternoon. So that's a quick, quick workflow. Awesome. we got another question. We'll get a mic over here. In the meantime, just before that question, Another one from uh, our live stream, Attilio, asked, um, how do you help your passengers, especially non-aviation flying friends, understand your personal minimums? Mike, you want to give any recommendations on that? Yeah, um, non-aviation friends is kind of a, a funny phrase because almost all my friends are aviation. So. <laughs> Mike has no non-aviation friends. Everybody that was non-aviation <laughs> is so now is now aviation, <laughs> so we converted them. Um, you know, I, I think it goes a little bit to the, the same thing, a, a similar question, which is, is how do you get the wives of spouses comfortable when they're not comfortable? How do you get the people, that, the new guys to, to get comfortable? And I think it's to just be really candid and uh, just talk to them very openly and say, there are risks, don't try and convince them otherwise. There are risks. We mitigate those risks. Here's what we're doing to do that. And I like to just be very open and uh, let them know why it is going to be a safe flight. And if something goes wrong, what we have prepared to, to get back down on the ground safely. And uh, if they're still okay with flying, let's go. And if you're not, I completely understand because uh, general aviation does have a higher risk level than the big aircraft. And that's just a fact. And I, I don't want to hide that from anyone. So I have found that uh, letting people know there's risks and here they are usually makes them go, oh, I knew there was, but I like you, I like you telling me about it. Let's go fly. <laughs> oh, there aren't any. Now you get into to debate about, but I heard, well, no, it's risky. I'm going to try not to be risky. And the best thing you can do is be as professional as possible with your non-flying passengers. Treat it like an airline flight and treat, just fly as smooth and comfortably as possible in the best weather you can find to not scare them off of aviation. My first exposure to aviation was with a guy that just immediately started doing steep turns and mild aerobatics and just about turned me off to the whole concept of going flying, trying to make me sick. And that's not the way to introduce people to flying. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll just add to it, but um, when we fly for our work, the first plane we started flying was this uh, Twin Diamond DA-62 over here. And one of the first things we do, kind of backing up what Juan said, is we tell everybody, 
hey, safety is our number one concern. And just like in the airlines, we may cancel the flight due to weather, we may cancel due to mechanical, like there's other things. And our ability to recover from those, i.e. a mechanical issue or something like that, is not like the airlines, right? So uh, we did a flight out to uh, Southern California somewhere, um, went to go start up, had ECU failures, and we sent our passengers home on a commercial flight while me and the other pilot worked on testing it. So just setting those expectations in my mind as early as possible that this, is, this flight is subject to cancellation. Um, you don't have to force a flight to go through um, or, or believe that like your flight must always go through, you know, kind of acknowledge yeah. it like other people do. Okay, uh, question back here in the room. Oh, yeah. you want to add? Oh, I, I have a story if we have time. I have an a eight to 10 minute story, but I, I really want to end on a happier note. So if we have time, you let me know. Only I'm happy tell you stories from now, Mike. Yeah. Oh, yeah, happy <laughs> stories. Yeah. If we have time, well, go yeah. ahead after. Yeah, uh, my question uh, is uh, coming from the point, I'm just about to turn into the non-killing zone. Um, that's uh, arbitrary number and I'm excited about it. 300 uh, hours? 300 hours, right. But I keep reading about accidents and keep reading about people, ATP pilot, 10,000 hours, 5,000 hours, 4,000 hours. It's like, what chance do I have? In, and the question is, do you see the difference between the type of accidents, the type of negligence, or whatever might be involved between those killing zone pilots and those with a thousand of hours? Well, and maybe just to add to that question, because I think you bring up a really interesting point with ATP level pilots, airline pilots that end up in what I would consider more general aviation aircraft, and then they get in trouble. Do you want to talk a little bit about sort of that transition and, and why do we see these 10,000 plus hour airline pilots sometimes run into trouble as they jump into smaller aircraft? Well, one thing is they are jumping back into general aviation for probably the first time in years. Um, a lot of airline pilots get to that part of their career where they don't want to have nothing to do with general aviation. Um, and then other pilots will jump back into it after a long stay away from it. I've remained in general aviation my whole career, and I've always owned airplanes, bought and sold airplanes. So if you jump back into GA um, with a long pause in your career, you're back in the killing zone. You're back in that 300-hour thing real quick. And in fact, you're possibly even more so because in the airlines, everything is taken care of for you. I've got dispatchers, I've got mechanics, I've got a full weather team. All I gotta do is show up on time and drive that airplane. In general aviation, it's all on you. And the average airline pilot may have a rough transition period transitioning to, to that back to general aviation. I love that. Okay, this is a good question uh, for both of you guys, but this is from John. He says, for us student pilots, how can we evaluate our CFI to ensure that they have the same safety emphasis that I do? So if you guys were going to let your kids learn to fly and had to pick a CFI that wasn't one of you, how do you help them evaluate a good CFI? Oh, boy. So that's, that's a really good question, guys, because um, my twin brother Mark and I have had our kids go through this process and knowing the risks in that few hundred hour starting phase is really high and that's where our flight instructors are at typically. Um, I told my son I have a list of friends so it's a little easier for me um, and Mark's kids also. Um, However, we said, but if you want to use this school or that school, find the least arrogant pilot is lo more likely to be the safest pilot. Find the pilot that is saying, I'm still learning, but I will be safe. The guy who is the arrogant pilot, especially at two to 300 hours, scares me to death. Uh, I, I, it's a hard one. I, I want, for my kids, I want to find a higher time one, but they aren't always available. Not always, everyone gets that choice. 
But if I can't pick and I'm at a school and there's going to be, I got 300-hour instructor to 800-hour instructor, which one? Find the one that's canceling is, go in and say to the, who's the one that cancels because of wind more often? Who's the one that uh, has canceled more flights than anyone else? And that might mean he's not very good or he's uncomfortable, but I'd rather have the guy that decided to cancel who isn't a top gun, I'm the best of the best, um, teaching my kids than someone who's um, arrogant. I love that. One of the things I did when I was starting my pilot training is I interviewed the chief pilot and asked him which flight instructors in the school they would refer their family members to. Great. And I got two out of like five or six of the instructors in this one, one school. And I said, okay, those are the only instructors I'm going to work with. Um, one thing, though, for uh, John, I think, who asked this question online is, in that book, The Killing Zone, as they analyze the safety records, flight training is, uh, even though it's your first, you know, roughly 50 or 60 hours, it has a really high safety margin. And part of that is because flight training um, puts you in a very tight box, um, typically speaking. And so the, the flight instructors are taken off uh, out of the same air, airport every day. They're doing the same exercises every day. And, and that is what helps create a really safe environment. Um, I think the, the bigger question that a lot of young pilots, as soon as they pass their private pilot certificate, should ask is, with 50 or 60 hours and one cross country, am I really that prepared to start doing 100, 200 mile cross countries um, uh, with no nobody else tethered there? And I think, you know, if you're following everything your instructor said and you're doing everything there, I think, I think you'll be good. But that's when I think the real learning starts is uh, all of a sudden after that. And if you look at a lot of flight instructors, they, uh, they'll go hundreds of hours uh, of flight training that's all dual instruction before they really start uh, in a part of their career where they're soloing these young pilots. And so um, when I started in my late 30s, finished at 50 hours and all of a sudden wanted to go fly, I thought, you know, I'm going to keep bringing somebody with me for a while. And I learned more on all that cross-country flying than I, I feel like than I did even in the, in the first 50 hours, um, having an instructor next to me. Just flying with another pilot. Yeah, flying yeah. with another pilot yeah. who is way more experienced mm -hmm. than, I, than I am. Okay, uh, we had another question. Did we back here? Any other questions? Oh, one in the back. And then um, we got two more online. So kind of like to get on the student pilot thing, I went to a, like a popular 141 school out on the East Coast, and I actually ended up leaving due to safety reasons um, in training because of how the instructors were just pushing you through as fast as you can just to take your check ride and had degraded um, like learning. And they were teaching other students their degraded learning, and it would just ended up being uh, just a cascading effect of uh, instructors were on their phone texting, uh, like texting the dispatch, "Hey, uh, sorry, the plane's going to be back late." Or on their phones, and just the rush kind of of them just build time to get to the airlines. Do you see this? kind of like the accident we probably saw two weeks ago of Bowling Green where the student was with an instructor who was Snapchatting the whole entire time telling him that this guy is Forrest Gump and it's slow. Oh, Do you yeah, see yeah. this becoming a kind of a bigger problem in the industry of quick time building, quick get your ratings and then We're at a, a, the a record uh, pilot shortage right now so we are desperately short of pilots and so Flight training schools are spooling up like crazy. You got crazy growth right here at this airport for flying training. So these sort of problems are going to be a natural part of that progression, unfortunately. Hopefully that's a, more of the exception, but oh my gosh. Yeah, that's scary. Okay, Mike, you had a question online that was asking. They said, uh, wait, I lost it here. Mike, congrats on the pool build progress. <laughs> Can you share any updates on airplanes you are currently building? Yeah, that's what I want to know. <laughs> yeah, um, 
there is a, there's an aircraft I'm doing an STC project on. I can't share it, but I am working on that feverishly. It is uh, a whole lot of papers and then a little build and then a whole lot of papers and a little build, but I'm super excited about that project and I will announce that later. Um, I just wrapped up a, a military project I finished up. I'm really excited about I can't talk about that one either, but it's aviation and it was a lot of fun. What I can talk about is two other planes uh, we're building. My wife's building a carbon cub right now and uh, it's about ready for fabric. I'm excited about. I've been building one right alongside her. Um, I have scrappy, so I'm just going to sell mine, but it seemed more natural for us to build two planes together. And then uh, when my carbon cub's done, I'll, I'll just uh, let it go and my wife can fly her. So that's been really fun. That's coming close. And then, uh, and then I have started tinkering on uh, Draco. I haven't officially started it at all. Yeah. But, you know, uh, whenever I get a chance, we sand off some paint. We <laughs> do a few mods. I did hack the wings off and started some changes there. Not off, but kind of. I cut, I cut them the ends off and making some moderators. Wait, well, I cut the whole front of them off. And, well, I cut a lot of things off it. <laughs> But Draco but I will rise again. But I haven't officially started it, but yeah, it's missing a lot of stuff right now. <laughs> um, but I'm really excited about that. It's going to be really, really fun. Who, who wants to see Draco fly again? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Project Phoenix. <laughs> yeah, we're excited. The, the one that I crashed? No, 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 no. I, I, I actually have done something really, really special with Draco that's a little bit emotional and I hope to do great things for aviation. I, I'm not prepared to announce it yet. I'm still working on it, but I've done something with Draco and it's been a lot of work and it's been over a year of effort and, it, and we'll get to that later. But the, the original Draco is no more, but it will live on. But what about the, uh, the racing airplane? Oh, the racing airplane? Yeah, yeah. The racing airplane, I have not had time to touch it. I've uh, been still looking for a, an engine. I've got one um, sitting, showed up in my hangar. I haven't opened the box yet. It is a little more powerful. Um, <laughs> but I'm not, I honestly don't know if it'll fit. I have a different, it has a different size fuel controller and a few things, but I got to open it up and see if it'll work. The challenge with this is the plane's way over there and the engine's here. Um, I haven't had a chance to even open the box between everything else I've got going on, so I don't know when that one will, will go, but that one will be uh, when I finally decide if the engine I've already bought for it, which is a, a, a first run engine, hasn't, it's not even halfway to its first overhaul and a, first, and a fresh hot section, new engine, new engine. Uh, yeah. I'll talk about it later. <laughs> so, but, but, but the thing is, if it doesn't fit, then, then I'll uh, overhaul, get another engine. Yeah. But it, we don't know yet. And then I'll have to load up a trailer and bus and drive out and do the whole thing there and fly it back. So. Oh. Just, just a minor project. Yeah. <laughs> Weekend project. But, uh. Did we see one more question out here? Yep. Of all the airplanes you've flown, which is your favorite? And of all the airports you've landed at, which is your favorite and why? Go ahead, go first. Well, there's <laughs> airplanes and motorcycles. You need a favorite airplane for each specific mission. So you need a whole <laughs> hangar full of airplanes. It all depends. If you want to fly aerobatics, I personally love the Pitt Special. That was one of my favorite airplanes that I ever owned and had the pleasure of flying. If I want to fly airliners, I got to choose the 757. It's the most overpowered hot rod Ferrari airliner there is. Um, uh, Warbirds, it's got to be a P-51, but I've never had the opportunity to fly one yet. So it depends what airplane and what mission. Yeah, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mimic that. I, that is like, asking me that question is like saying, <laughs> And I might want a few more. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I have this uh, problem where I grow in hangers, not so much what's my favorite plane. But the short answer is, uh, it's, it's a lot like Juan just said, 
Um, Draco is magical to me. Hmm. It was the plane that when I hit the throttle, one person or four people in it, high and hot, loaded or empty, you just started laughing. Like literally, you, everyone in the plane's face goes up because it drops you in your seat and just goes. And that one, uh, it was just a giggle machine. It was just a, a riot. Um, and then the other uh, turbulence, I've, had, I've got so many hours on that plane. That plane is just a bullet. And to have something with so much power that you can't use more than half of it on the runway because it will turn itself off the runway. Um, that plane, you can't even go full throttle till you are gear up, flaps up, and through 160 knots before you can wind it up and let it go. And when you even get up at the speed it will do going down the runway, uh, and you literally could steer with your throttle if you went ahead and used all your foot to the floor, you can steer with throttle. But you're already sunk in your seat and blown away at what it's doing. You come off the ground, you tuck the gear up, flaps up, and you're going like crazy, and you go, oh yeah, I got 500 more horsepower, and you just, <laughs> boom. It is unbelievable and so fast, and I, I don't care what kind of pilot you are, and it never gets old when, they, when ATC says, uh, a uh, 7, 707 Mike, Mike, uh, watch at your 12 o'clock, you're overtaking a jet. Um, turn 10 degrees right, and you're like, yeah, do that's that. a good day. <laughs> it's a good day. Uh, what was your record for uh, taking off here to the top of Tampa? Tampa oh, so there's a video out there. You can watch that. There's a video of turbulence uh, racing around Temp and back. Um, it, I don't remember the time. It's very okay. short. Yeah, I, I don't even remember as long enough ago, but let me tell you something about that video. That video is out there racing around uh, Tim. Um, that video was turbulence with 690 horsepower. So when you watch that video and it's doing four or 5,000 feet per minute while still doing a ground speed that's mind-numbing, um, that video is so outdated from <laughs> what turbulence is capable of. Turbulence now um, can do 10,000 feet a minute um, and uh, be making some serious ground. If you, I, I need to do a video about that when I bring it back, even if I just put the same motor back in it. That video, I, that, that aircraft I raced to uh, Las Vegas against my premier A1A jet. Um, and to give you an idea, that jet's 460 knots. And uh, my brother had it, and I took mine because we needed more seats than the Premier had. I sent him down the runway first on Spanish Fork right here. It is something unique to have a jet go uh, take off in front of you that's 460 knots capable. You take off and beat him to Las Vegas by two minutes, even though I'm not 460 knots capable. It climbs so fast at such a high ground speed that I'm nose over level going through the eye and that jet's plane catch up not leveling off for 20 minutes um, that that plane now of course uh, that that eclipse would pass it to to go into texas but like here to las vegas i could beat a 460 knot jet because it's time to climb is 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 staggering okay we're going to see if we got one more question if not we're going to wrap up and then go from there right here Enjoy it. <laughs> the, uh, the airline thing, uh, how old are you right now? I'm 26. Okay, you're in good shape. The main thing with the airlines is seniority is everything. So the, generally, the quicker you get there, the better seniority you'll have and the better your career is overall. So if you can um, expedite that or, or be as efficient as you can getting to the airlines, that's, that's a strong consideration. And that's not much of a problem nowadays. In the old days, that was a problem. Nowadays, you can get there pretty darn quick. So other than that, uh, enjoy, enjoy it while you can. It's going to be, it's, it's not all going to be fun. It's, you're going to be feeding from a fire hose and you need to be able to learn like that. You need to be able to learn to drink from a fire hose because by the time that you get to the airlines, they don't have the, 
extra time for extra training. They've got a set training program. You have to get through that pipeline like everybody else in the required amount of time. And you may only get one or two extra days of training max. So you got to be able to learn real fast. So it's not as much about enjoying the journey as it is being able to learn real quick. But it seems like you found a way to stay in general aviation oh, yeah. as you've been in the airlines. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, you know, part of why I, I love the topic of safety and everything else is, is we need to be reminded of that. We want to increase pilot safety. But at the same time, I feel like general aviation, the Part 91 flying, it is some of the best flying oh, yeah. that we get to do and enjoy. So hopefully you can stay involved in that. Let's give Mike and Juan a huge round of applause. Good job, and Mike. God yeah, dang. I've got something for Power each of you guys. Of aviation, man. Nobody oh, else does thanks. it like he does. <laughs> yeah. Thank I've you. got something for each of you guys. We did a <laughs> Hangar 107 Aviation Safety Advocate Award for each of you, Mike. Thank you. All right. And uh, for you, Juan. Great. Thanks, sir. Thank you both for <laughs> not just your videos online that all of us love to watch, but also the messages that you give that inspires us and other aviators not just to have fun, but to have fun and, and stay safe at the same time. So thank you both. Thanks. That's right. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Thank you. For those who are here in person, uh, these guys are going to be sticking around for a minute. So definitely take the opportunity to shake their hands and get to know them. And uh, for those of you online, we'll, we'll be signing off here shortly and hopefully uh, you can make it here to the next one. If you did not directly RSVP, the QR code uh, is there for you so you can RSVP even now after the event, learn about other events we do here in the future. So thanks again. Thanks for uh, being here at Spanish Fork and Hangar 107 and for uh, this awesome fly-in we did today. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Good job. Thank you, Mark.